This morning, we're going to be looking in um, to just a, a powerful portion of Scripture in the Gospel of John, where John, where Jesus will make a proclamation, one of his I am proclamations. He'll say, I am the bread of life in this coming up passages. Today, we won't quite get to that portion. But, but what John brings alive for us in this text is who Jesus is and his power and his authority all the way through it. We have just finished over the last couple weeks uh, the encounter with Christ where he is uh, been in the wilderness there. Literally multitudes have followed. They came without food and Jesus then takes the five barley loaves and the couple fish and he's fed them all and their wives and their children and so thousands were fed. And in this radical, powerful miracle that was taking place, there was some whose heart said, you know what, we need that guy to be president. <laughs> we need that guy to be king. Because he's just buffet in the wilderness. We need someone to provide like that. And so they began with their flesh to say, hey, here's what we need because it fits what we are longing for in the flesh. Carnally, they understood this. So Jesus separates himself out and he sends his disciples away. And then we came to the wonderful encounter that we get of Christ there. Oh, well, the, the disciples in the midst of the Sea of Galilee dealing with the turbulent water and, uh, and Jesus coming out in the midst of the dark and right there walking on the water and Peter standing with them. It's an amazing, amazing account. The moment Christ gets into the boat, John tells us the boat was at the other side. Miracle, miraculous power revealing himself as the Son of God. There were still so many left that wondered what had taken place. And where we, we pick up in the scripture, we pick up where those are asking, where did Jesus go? <laughs> How did he get to the other side? And they pursue him to find out a lot of these questions. Well, what we're going to really talk about in this text is Christ is going to challenge us to be a people that don't just hunger and work for food that perishes, but that we'd be a people that would hunger and thirst after those that, things that endure to everlasting life. There's a contrast in it. In fact, all through the scriptures, Proverbs and Psalms and even the Old Testament, we see this contrast always given. You can either go this direction with your best understanding and all of your own desires, or you can surrender into the place of power and peace and life in following after Christ. There's kind of this, the, 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 these contrasts, and so in many ways that's what Christ does. And today, I titled uh, the message Imperishable. Now, isn't it true that all your stuff breaks? <laughs> okay, is it just my stuff that breaks or does everyone's stuff break? It's like, the stuff is broke. We just, we just got that. I, I, I can't tell how often I said, well, did, well, well, didn't we just get that? Well, it has been four years. What? Shouldn't it go longer than four years? No, everything breaks. <laughs> everything seems to just degrade and break and fall apart. It perishes in this world. It doesn't get better. Your car doesn't get, well, some cars have gotten better because... No, that's all in the story. But most things, right, don't appreciate in value. They decrease and they perish in this world. In fact, uh, the other day, uh, two days ago, I had a kind of an interesting moment. And I, I'm sorry for my, my initial reaction because it, it puts my wife in a disparaging light. And it is Mother's Day. Why would I do that? You're a great mom. I love you. You've done a great job with our kids. But I was walking out to the car. And I got my new vibe on. I got like a new shirt on and I got my, my, my pants on. I'm ready to go to a meeting and so I'm all dialed up and got my deal going on. I run out there and she comes out onto the, the deck and as she comes out on the deck, I get to the car and boom, I feel hit. And I, my first thought was, did she just throw something at me? <laughs> now in further respect, inspection, as I looked down and across my arm, I noticed that it actually was an eagle that had visited us at a high altitude, and it, it, it hit me in the chest, and it went down my arm, and it went all the way down my pants, and it went into my shoe. And it, I've got video, too. I don't have it for you this morning, but I do have video for it. And so everything had to be changed. I had to go back and get a new outfit on, which is what every man calls their dress. An outfit, by the way, side, side note, just for clarification. Uh, I had to go back in and everything was demolished. Uh, God's going to show us those things that remain eternally and don't perish. And we'll be challenged to be a people that will look after the things of the kingdom and not the things of the world. So let's take up in this portion, uh, John chapter 6, verse 22. On the following day, when the people were standing on the other side of the sea, saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. There's a conundrum. There was a boat, 
The disciples got in that boat. Jesus didn't get in that boat, and that boat is gone. However, verse 23, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So like he's not here, we're going to get in these boats, we're going to go across to Capernaum, we're going to seek after him and find him where he is. Now, so hopefully... Every time you read through the word of God, your heart is wide open to just hear and say, God, what are you teaching me through the, the, you know, the most mundane passages or even just the, the, the passages that take us from one big moment to another and seeing the things that God can teach us. And right off the bat, there's a couple little things that I think help us in our pursuit after the things that don't perish. And it has to do with just some dynamics in this message. So here it says that these boats were there, that they had docked, near the place where they had had bread and the Lord had given thanks. John makes note of this miraculous event of the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, even in the storyline, he's just like, well, the, the boat came right to the place where, the, where they ate the bread and where Jesus gave thanks. It was a powerful, two powerful things, not just simply the, the feeding of those, but that Jesus himself surrendered to the Father. You see how he's drawing us in to see Christ's deity, who he is. It's, it's a vital part of our walk to be a people that take note of things God has done. Now, it can be really simple for us to see God do something somewhere and then make that place an idol. You know, go, well, here is the place. In fact, if you go to Israel, you can find many different idols that have been set up going, this is the spot, you know, and you've got, and the the churches have built stuff up around it all over the place, and often they're incorrect. And if you read the scriptures, you find, well, that isn't actually where it happened. They just built a monument, and people start worshiping at the monument. Guys, we do this in our heart sometimes when it comes to God. We see God do something. We've prayed. I I remember early on in ministry when we were in Colorado, and and, uh, I had had prayed at this certain bench uh, in the back of the the school that we were meeting in. I came out and that day just happened to be, God really moved in a powerful way. And I remember the next Sunday going, I need to go pray at that bench. You know, and I'm stomping back there to get at the bench because like I've got to go to the same spot. And I realized, well, that's idolatry, you know, in, in setting up there. But, but there's something different about really setting a marker in our hearts. Now, the, 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 because Really, that's what the scripture is, is we've got one mark after another, one Ebenezer of God's movement all the way through the scriptures. But am I doing that actively in my life, aware of how God has spoken, when he's touched my heart, how he's helped me through something? I began journaling a while ago. I was not a big journaler early in my faith. But I began to journal a bit and write text down and just what God was putting on my heart. And, and I, I went back over it um, the last couple of days when I was preparing for this message. And I began to look at um, some journals that I had when, um, when I had gone through that physical trial and I was in the hospital for a bit. And I was amazed at how it changed because I was in the midst of trial. And in, interestingly, in the midst of trial, I, I was just, I was just surrendered. I know where to go. I was surrendered. And in that surrendering, I was just gulping in the things of eternity. And so I wrote poems. <laughs> You're never hearing one. Uh, you know, but... <laughs> I, 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 wrote, I wrote so many different things and what was beautiful is for me because they're my handwriting it's the moment that I was thinking and how God was moving just by reading through some of those elements and remembering I was like God met me right there he's going to meet he's going to meet me right here he met me right there he's going to meet me right now and it just, that remembrance. And so here, even in the story, right? Oh, the boats came to the place where the feeding of the bread and where Christ was praying to the Father. God wants us to have remembrance to think of those things that he is doing and, remi- and be reminded. Not, not an altar, but a remembrance. Now that he saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples. Now when we're making big decisions in our life about a choice, a direction in life, we want to make sure that in our decision, Jesus is in it. So there they were, and they're like, well, what are we going to do next? Well, where's Jesus? I think that actually in itself. Now, obviously, this is just the narrative taking place before they go across to Damascus. But may that be something that actually happens in our life. That we say, wait a minute, is this a place Jesus wants me to be? Where is he? In fact, where's the evidence of his followers? It's a really clear way to make decisions of how you're living your life. You're getting ready to go to college. You look and you say, is Jesus in that college anywhere? Are there other students there that love the Lord? What kind of on-campus 
fellowship that they have going on. I, I, I want to see if not only Jesus is there, but God's people are there. They noticed Christ wasn't there and the disciples weren't there, and so it became a marker. And may that be for us as we devour the things of eternity looking for Christ in it and God's people. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those situations where you find yourself in a place that you know God is not there. And we're hoping he's not watching. I'm like, well, okay, this would be super awkward if you found me right here, you know? And he's like, well, yeah. He knows you're right there. He knows you're rising up and you're lying down. He knows right where you are, the thoughts before you have them, the words before you speak them. He is the God of all creation. And so I had a situation happen where we were trying to do something good for someone and we, we'd made a, um, a desire to help with some benevolence. And so we got, I got some um, debit cards for a gentleman who was really struggling and stuff. He'd lost his phone. His phone got stolen, all these things. And so he was calling me from a landline and I had to, I had to meet him where he was because he had no transportation. So I was just trying to find this guy. Finally, he calls me. I'm at this restaurant. Come get, you know, down. So I, I go downtown and I'm looking for the restaurant and I realize that it's not a restaurant. It's just a flat out bar. It's one of the lower State Street bars. And I mean, it is rocking. Boom, boom, psh, things are happening. The noise is coming out of it. And here's Pastor Tommy going, I'm looking for this restaurant. Um, here it is. And I began to walk in with my 33 years of sobriety, you know, okay, to the, the bar in the afternoon. And I look through the door. I'm thinking, this is the place. And there were just nothing but young girls sitting at the counter. And they were already drinking. And it was early in the afternoon. And things are going on. And, and I'm not going to name anybody. A couple of you were there. And um, no. <laughs> Whoa, did you just call me out in church? You, you weren't there. Okay, I've said that before, and then people go, did you know I was there? No, I didn't. I'm totally making that up as we go along. Pant, don't write me a letter. Do not write me a letter. I didn't see you. So, um, so I, I, I look in the door, and I began to move, and I went, you know, the, this, is, this is not the place for me to stand. It's not the place for me to go in. Not that I was fearful that, oh, no, I'm going to walk in. Okay, here it is. Time to go off the wagon. I wasn't, sorry, that was just, my pulpit became a bar. Did you see that? I became a pirate, too. <laughs> that keeps me sober, right? I just think, you know what? If you drink again, you're going to become a pirate. I'm patching the whole thing, so I, I stay away from it. But no, I'm, I'm sorry. I digress. I digress. So I, I stood at the door, and I screamed his name. I'm like, hey, I'm looking for this guy. I'm like, hey, uh, I'm looking, could, excuse me, Woo! can you get, have him meet me out here? And I went outside. I'm not going where God's people aren't. I'm not going where G Jesus isn't. And plus there's several things. I wasn't concerned whether I was going to stumble that day. God's redeemed me, set me free, and I'm, I'm standing in that boldly. But it would have been a stumbling for someone else. Could have been. Middle of the day going by. It's happened, you know. People have written letters. I saw Pastor Tommy at this restaurant, but he was at the bar when I was there trying to somehow bust me. And I was going to the bathroom. I walked by the bar. You know, so anyway, so, side note. So the, the point is, is that we've got to look, and this is a great way to make your decision. Is Jesus there? Is God's people there? If I'm making a decision to move someplace or, or move in my, my work, is, is God moving me? And, and, and is God's people kind of moving along with it? Are there other, others praying for me and praying with me in the process of moving forward? Then it says that they got in the boats, went to Capernaum, and they were seeking Jesus. So, so the first thing is that we'd be a people that would be remembrance of what God has done that we'd be alert to see where Jesus and his people are when we move forward. And then thirdly, actively seeking after him. It was a big deal to go, okay, we're going to get in these boats that came over from Tiberias and we're going to get over to Capernaum because we've got to find this guy. And they were, they were uh, motivated to get there and they saw uh, actively and purposely getting in and going after God. Christianity isn't about you and I just sitting back, coming on a Sunday, sitting back and kind of going, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then we go, good, I've done my chink truck in the box. It's about devouring eternal truths. It's about walking in love. The only way we can make a difference in this world is if you and I will walk in this love. Now, John chapter 6, verse 25. And when they had found him, so they get in the boats, they go over to Capernaum, on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Uh, it's kind of fun to see also in them, they're investigating how this happened. This is a beautiful characteristic for the child of God, is to be one who remembers what God is doing, who is actively going where Jesus is and his disciples, seeking after him, but then also investigating his power. It, it isn't about just simply having a staid, it's a beautiful thing to have a staid historical 
um, or uh, um, generational faith. My parents were saved. I go to church. We do our thing. Those are wonderful things. But we can never lose the desire of investigating what God wants to do. Looking into it. They're, they're like, how did, now, so how did you get here? Because what, 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 you, you didn't go in the boat. And how did you get across here? We saw the other boats. And so they're investigating kind of how, how he gets to this side. They're wanting to have some answers in here. How did you come? And so did, 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 did you come here? They're looking into it, looking for his authority, his power for what? Listen to what Jesus says to them. So he answered them and said, they've asked, well, how did you get here? And he says, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. He doesn't even answer the question. He just says, listen, what you're doing is you're not coming in because, because of what you saw. You're coming for the food. You're coming for the buffet. You, you feel like this is going to be, this is really what you need is your, your, your carnal appetite being satisfied. You ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, this uh, little quote from McLaren says this, and I, I got it from Enduring Word, and I like it. He says, they were quite unaffected by the wisdom of his words and the beauty of his deeds. But a miracle that found food precisely met their wants. A miracle that found food precisely met their wants. And so there was an, ex uh, there was an excited but impure enthusiasm, very unwelcome to Jesus. Had nothing to do with the word, the hope, the future, the eternal things that are in it. It simply had carnal blessing in it. And so that, that desire for being satisfied for what they wanted of themselves was what was driving them. Guys, this is the same motivation that false teachers use. In, in uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 17, Paul said, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. You see, the false teacher is going to use what's happening in your life and my life, which is we have carnal needs. We have physical needs that are constantly on it. We wake up, we're hungry. We have needs for uh, emotional support, encouragement, love, intimacy, hunger, thirst. All of these things are riding every single day and they're needing to be satisfied. The false teacher knows that about you. Therefore, an easy way to identify false teachers is when you see what they're going after in you. They're providing something that you carnally need. Oh, you know what? You need a better life. You need, you need more things in your life. In fact, this is, would be peace if you could own your own home and have your own thing and do your da -ba. And all oh, you, 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 you. It'd be wrapped up in it. God wants us to be very aware because we are going to hunger after something. Uh, look at Luke chapter 6, verse 21. I'm also going to read 25. But 21 says this. This is Jesus speaking. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are those who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now, Jesus is talking about this hungering for God and a sorrow over sin. It means I'm aware that I am a sinner in need of a savior and that my God loves me. And so there's a natural sense of hungering for what he has, which is forgiveness. And then there's a satisfying of our weeping by him redeeming us to himself. Verse 25 shows the contrast. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. If you've become satisfied with the things of this world, there'll be a moment where you hunger for eternal life. If you're satisfied with the laughter and frivolity of the world right now, there will be a moment when you're weeping before the judge of all creation. That, that, that's just how it works. And that contrast comes alive. We have a desire. You have in you, and I have in me, because we're fashioned in God's image, spirit, soul, and flesh. We have a desire for all of these things. We want to belong. We want to be loved. We have a need for intimacy. We have a need for, for, for satiation of our body. It needs to have fuel and it needs energy. All of these things are something that we naturally are wired up for. Where are we going to place our, our affections of it? Where are we going to try to get that satisfaction from? Verse 27. 
Jesus says, don't, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Don't labor for the food that which perishes. This is what Paul says in Romans 8, 6. He says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Again, with contrast. If we just simply go after peace and hope and belonging and satisfaction with our own understanding, we will end up wanting and dead. But if we will surrender to the one who fashioned us, delight in his provision, his direction, his hope, there will be life and hope and peace eternally. It, it, it's a pretty clear contrast. Which are we choosing? And sometimes we have great victory and it's like this week, boy, I just was, I woke up and felt like I've just gulping into the things of the kingdom and then sometimes you wake up and go, what is the deal? I gotta put this book down or these things down or this stuff, what, what, how have I let that back in my life? There could be one, one or uh, uh, many different scenarios that happen each day. The challenge is that you and I would be a people that would not just simply labor after the things that perish. Now, you think about what's happening in the world around us and there are new health fads and new style fads and all kinds of wild winds of doctrine that are roaming around us every day. There is a smorgasbord. Did I say that correctly? Smorgasbord. That's a funny word. Say that three times later and you're like, what is a smorgasbord? Anyways. Um, all of these fads and these every winds of doctrine. L listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That right there, guys, is the title of social media. The trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is head Christ. What are we laboring for? What are we doing with our time? What are we living after? Now, I'm not in any way saying all of you need to go and find robes and sneak away and all of a sudden be holy without anything happening. Live. God made us. He, he, he designed us this way. Love and life and, and all of these great things, but be careful what you're consuming in the process. See, God want, I mean, listen, the adventure that my wife and I have been on since we got saved and redeemed and in this church, raised up in this church and sent out has been an adventure like no other. We're, you, you listen, it makes van life look like a joke because it's like, what's, I'm sorry, I keep picking on van life. I like van life. Good for you. <laughs> I'm just saying the adventure that the world is seeking after pales in comparison to God allowing you to be in, in, in someone's life eternally to watch supernatural work of marriages being restored and children being reconciled to their parents and parents to their children and so on and so forth. These beautiful things that God does in it. It's intoxicating and beautiful. The question is, what are you laboring for? Here's what Ralph Waldo Emerson believes in regards to how and, what, and how we pursue peace. He says, and I don't, I don't follow him ever, nobody can bring you peace but yourself. That's, the, that's the, the grand idea of how to seek peace. You know what? You're not going to get it unless you do it yourself. You got to get it for yourself. This is, the, this is the, the narrative of the world. And guys, we must be alert to every ideology that's beginning to rear its head in the world right now because there are more than you can possibly imagine. This idea of ideology is a systems of ideas and ideals, especially in the forms that base a, a, a narrative surrounding economy or politics or religious policy and theory. And all of these things, these ideologies are rising up through the internet and through the world and the narrative around us, telling us something that is a lie from the devil. And it's broken, but we devour it like crazy. Because we hear a little bit of here on this news and a little bit on this news, and we go, oh my goodness, that's what's happening. You now can pick your gender. No, you can't. And I don't, I don't mean that in, an, in a mean way. I, I mean it in a reality way. It takes God out of the equation completely. And says, oh, now we're, now we're gods and we can decide what we want for what we want with our flesh. It's flesh oriented. But I'll tell you, the sympathetic part of us is aren't we heartbroken 
from anyone who's struggling with something, we're heartbroken. And we, not in judgment and heartbroken. You have to be careful, guys, because a lot of Christians are heartbroken with a sense of righteousness because of that's just wrong, right? And that's not it. God calls us to dine on the things that are eternal, which means his hope, which is laying our life down then for those who are suffering. But you have to be careful you haven't bought into the narrative. The ideology surrounding it, sexuality is a huge one. It's something the enemy is using. We're devouring it. That somehow it's okay for us to now talk about these things and, and have other people share them with our children at the earliest of age. That's what's wrong with the world. We need to start having a bunch of other strangers tell our kids about what they need for their bodies flesh-wise. Think about it. Your flesh is constantly on fire looking for what it wants and now you've got a, a plethora of people giving you all kinds of input. That is not of the Lord. Parents, on this day, Mother's Day, it's our opportunity to love and to give an opportunity for our children to see something different than they see in the world, which is that we're submitted to the God of all creation. Not in, not in righteous laws, not in condemnation of the broken. That, forget that. That's gross. That'll cause them to run the other direction. Is that they see that we're accountable to a God that is loving and caring and thoughtful and selfless for the broken and sharing that out there, but guarding and blessing what God has given us. He's made you beautiful in his image male and female. He's fashioned us in his image, spirit, soul, and flesh for his purposes. But it's, it's invading the body of Christ all across the world. And now all of a sudden you don't quite know what to say. In fact, I may get hate mail for what I've said here this morning. And all I'm saying is that God made you beautiful. Just love him about it. Don't let your flesh be the thing that really, think about race. This is another one that just, it can, it can get literally broken Instead of understanding we are made in God's image and we're all weird. Look at us. <laughs> we're all a pack of bizarre weasels made by our king in, in different shapes and sizes and all this stuff. And yet if we begin to follow after these things and devour the, 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 the food that perishes, we'll find ourselves dropping into that politics Parenting, boy, I tell you, the, ideo the new ideologies around parenting, it seems like every new generation has a baby and then goes, our parents knew nothing. This new book out, about, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, this is how you feed a baby. <laughs> what? You know, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry to hassle you if you got a new parenting book. I'm sure there's new good stuff and we're, every time we learn, but I'll tell you, we're also learning a bunch of things that are, that are coming in that are, that are detrimental and, and broken, that, that literally need to just go back to, the basics on it. So we have to look for those. What are we devouring? Here, it's all wrapped up in this. We're looking for peace. We're looking for love. We're looking for the fullness of joy in how we live. That's what every person on earth is longing for. And some misguided, all of us, in one way or another, putting the wrong things into our life. God gives it a very clear definition in this. And in verse 9 of chapter 15 in John, he says, As the Father loved me, it's Jesus, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That, that abiding in his love and that commandment is key to understand. It isn't just talking about the Ten Commandments. These are the things that Christ has spoken and lived before others, which is to love your enemy and pray for those who spitefully accuse you, to love your brother as yourself and your neighbor as yourself. These are radical, powerful things. Jesus is saying, look, walk with me. Walk as I walked and love like I loved. And he says, not only will I abide in you, where was I left off in verse 10, um, and, and abide in his love, verse 11, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Remain in you. It doesn't perish. So if we'll walk in that love, as he's asked us to love, well then there's joy overflowing. There's the fullness of joy in grabbing hold of that. Th then you and I have an opportunity in the midst of the things that are going on around us to hopefully be a light or to be a help and to care for those who are suffering. This is a big deal and to help people see that it's a safe place to be vulnerable and healed and restored and loved and all of these things. He says, but, but for the food, you should not hunger and, and, and labor after those, but rather for the food that endures to everlasting life. Listen to Isaiah 55, verse two. He says, why do you spend money 
on what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy. In light of just what I was talking about, all of these things we put energy into time, into money, and it doesn't satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. To, to, to devour God's word. To eat the fullness or to be satiated. Remember in the... In the um, Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's the hungering here and the devouring of what God has for us. Don't listen to all of the things that say, well, have you really read the Bible? Because it's full of hate and brokenness. Uh, excuse me. It, it's a story of man's depravity and God's grace and forgiveness and love. It's a, it's, it's, you don't listen to that, but rather devour on the other. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord of hosts. What are we devouring? Are we drinking in and eating of those things that lead to everlasting life? It's, it's what the son, and here's, here's where it comes from, the son of God or the son of man will give you. Everlasting blessing, the son of man will give you. He uses the phrase son of man uniquely here, not in calling himself the Christ, or the Messiah at this time, but wanting them to understand that as a man, he came to satisfy the sin of the world by being the sacrifice for all mankind. Verse 14 of chapter four in John, Jesus said, but whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So right in this sentence, he goes, look, you've come for the wrong thing. You're, you're, you're hungering after the things that perish. Long for the things that are, are eternal and have eternal hope behind them. Devour all of those because they were given, you were given grace by the God of all creation. He, he gives you water that's living water. He, he saves you by grace. It's a gift from him. He, he redeems us from death. The wages of sin is death. He redeems us for, through Christ. The text says that not only does the Son of Man give it to you, but God the Father has set his seal on him. And John here, as he's writing this great little narrative, allows the listener to understand that Jesus is speaking specifically of those moments when he was baptized. And then when he was baptized, you remember he came up out of the water and the Father in heaven spoke and John heard it, others heard it. The Father saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The ministry was established in that moment like a seal upon him. What, what, it, what it, the word seal means is a possession. This one belongs to me, is from me, it is mine. And Jesus was sealed by not only that work, but then his works as he walked through it. Let's go on to finish in these last two verses here. Verse 28. And they said to him, well, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? <laughs> it's what we want to do. He's like, okay, that sounds great. Uh, how can we do it ourselves? How, how can we do the work of God? What, 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 what do I just, just tell me what I want to do. We want to buy the trinket. We want to rub the stone. We want to stand in the right spot, whatever it is. We want to bow down to the thing. We want to go to the place where it is. Show us how to do these works and we'll do it. We're always changing and transforming God's good blessing. In Philippians 2 verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. Verse 29, Jesus answered him and said this. And this is where we end. This is the work of God, that you believe in him that he has sent. Believe in Jesus. See, the work that we should labor for is believing in Christ. And guys, it's, it's, it's a job. Every day we're challenged with choices. Every day we're challenged with a new narrative to try to figure out and understand, is Jesus in it? Is God's people around it? Does it make sense? Does it line up with God's word? We're face to face every single day with choices to make. And the work is to stay faithful and knowing who's over all of it. He loves you. He has you in your hardest trial. He's the shepherd that walks through the valley of the shadow of death with you. And we will fear no evil because he's with us. He's the one who stands nearby and knows our rising up and lying down. And he will work his good purpose while we're here to his glory. But in a moment, we'll be present before him. The challenge is, 
Have you done the work? Have you believed on Jesus for your life? That's where, that's where it is, on this day. It's what allows you to come into the fullness of joy is knowing him, believing in him, and walking in him. Will you stand with me? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, speaking of Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He, this is Jesus, said to him, What is written in the law? What, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Lord God, thank you that it is as simple as our, our hearts and minds seeking you above all, surrendering and believing. And God, I'd ask that just in these moments, maybe, maybe you'd do that in, in hearts. I know you'd do that in every heart that turns towards you. And, and if you're here this morning and you're longing for that peace, you're longing to stop devouring the things of the world and you're ready to just walk in something new, it starts here. And believing. And you can pray right along with me, just right where you are. Lord God, I believe you. Forgive me for the things I've devoured, the places I've gone, things my hands have handled. Wash me clean. Fill me up and give me strength to walk in the things that endure to everlasting life. I want to see you hear your voice and have the fullness of joy in our heart. Make me your own, Lord God, I believe you. Father, meet us as we close in worship. And I know there's many different needs. There's physical needs. There's some emotional, spiritual things that are needed here this morning. We want to place these at your feet. We want to knock on your door and say, God, would you take these? Would you give us strength in them? Would you give us wisdom in them? And so move us now as we worship you. As we put you above all things, meet us in this time of prayer and worship in Jesus' name. Amen.